Hey what's up gamers, it's been a while since my last video. I don't know about you, but to me it kinda feels like I've abandoned my channel. One thing that I haven't abandoned is my NES game, and I've been working on it basically every day. I guess my excuse of not making videos it would be that I can spend that time developing the game instead. Plus, recently there were not that many visible or exciting changes to show off. But since I finally decided to make this update, let's see what's new with the game. I've noticed a few comments stating that the main character is moving way too fast and there was even a suggestion to implement the momentum for the movement. I also was not a big fan of how the character moved, so I had to do something about it. First thing was to investigate similar looking games. I checked Ghostbusters 2, Harvest Moon on, on the SNES, uh, the first Legend of Zelda and even Don't Starve. And guess what, the main characters in those games move at a constant pace. So the acceleration is out of the question, if you think about it, it's kind of useless and plus it's quite difficult to implement. And this game is more like Harvest Moon than Super Mario Bros, where you need to accelerate to jump over a huge gap. So only change I made was to reduce the main character speed in half and make it slow as heck. At least that's how it felt to me because I was used to the lightning fast movement. But I didn't dwell on that and went on to work on some other features. I thought maybe I can get used to the slow movement as well. I solved a quite complicated bug uh, that happened because of the bank switching. If you remember, I uh, had to switch between 16 kilobyte banks to fully use uh, the 128 kilobyte ROM space. There was this issue when the NMI was activated during the audio update. During that time, the bank 6 was active and the NMI switched to the bank 4 and this bank uh, remained at the end of the NMI routine. Since all the audio code was in the bank 6, after the NMI was executed, the game simply became unresponsive. Now, at the beginning of the NMI, I always check what bank is active, and if the NMI manages to switch to some other bank, at the end of the NMI routine, I switch back to the, that very bank that was active at the beginning. That helped me to solve the issue, or at least I thought so. Then simply I had some fun and implemented that the bear would go to sleep at night. Won't talk to you and no longer would take your items. You would have to wait until the morning. I wanted to test this feature out by playing the game, but I quickly realized that because of the very slow movement of the main character, the game has become incredibly difficult. I could not even gather berries for the jam because every time I went out at night I could not run away from the werewolves anymore. Then I had an idea, why not to add running to the game. I had already the button A that was only used for cancelling menus, so I decided to use that button to activate the running mode. Although I didn't want to add any additional stats like stamina to complicate everything even more. But then I thought maybe I could use the food stat instead of stamina, huh? First of all, I needed to make two movement speeds possible. So moving the main character by one pixel would be equivalent to walking and moving it by two pixels would be same as running. Unfortunately, my code was a huge mess and it only supported a single movement speed. In fact, there was a bug that I even didn't notice that corrupted the collision detection system when I slowed down the movement. So there went one day of me trying to write my crappy code. After fixing it, I finally managed to get two speeds working. Well, kind. Because I got stuck for a few days trying to figure out why the heck the collision messes up when I try to move in different speeds, especially in the first map segment. I thought it's probably happening because of the 
sloppily written collision detection code because the glitch usually appeared when I tried to bump into obstacles. I sat there and I simply could not figure out what to do or how to fix it. Then finally I said screw it, I went outside for some skateboarding session and played Return to Castle Wolfenstein until 4am. The next day I found the culprit of this bug surprisingly fast. Apparently the collision detection code was fine, but there was this one scrolling variable which if my code were perfect should not exist. So I was resetting that variable incorrectly. Also I discovered that uh, I also discovered that the player's X coordinate fluctuates by a few pixels when the player reaches the center of the screen. And I thought it always stays the same when the player is at the center. So yeah, I somehow managed to fix the bug and it's finally possible to walk and run without any glitches. Now it was time to finish up the running mechanics. Even though I didn't want to, in the end I added the stamina. It's invisible though, once you hit the A button and start moving, the stamina fills up by taking few points from the food stat. Running constantly drains the stamina, but as long as you have enough food points, you will be able to refill it. But when both food and stamina will run out, the running will be impossible and only possibility would be to walk. So why not to try to complete the bear's quest again? Uh oh, something's not right. How come the bank switching bug is still there? I already fixed it. Actually, the problem now is because the NMI routine taking way too long. So when this code line enables the NMI, it was called again directly from the NMI routine. So that, that means NMI could be called from itself. That ruins the bank number that I save at the beginning of the NMI routine. Now I added an additional check to see if the previous NMI routine was executed until the end and if it's not then I simply not save the bank number at the beginning of NMI routine. Hopefully this bug is fixed now. So as I intended before I implemented multiple quests for an NPC. I added a second quest for the bear and I also made quests loop. So if you complete the second quest and return to the bear's hut the bear will ask you for some jam again. I also made that it would be possible to draw sprites during the NPC dialogue. Previously I had to copy and paste berry tiles from the sprite tileset to the background tileset so I could print out them along with the text. But since there would be more quests with different items this style duplication would not work anymore. Since the character is much slower now, while walking back and forth, I've noticed that the first location is, well, it's a bit too long and quite boring. So I've decided to remove one screen and instead of that, to add a entry point to a new location that would have another villager house. Up until this point, all the locations and entry points were hard coded, so that means every entry point had its unique code piece that checked uh, if player entered the house or maybe entered a new location and so on. Also every map had its own unique loading routine. The more locations and maps there were, the more messy everything got. So I finally decided that's enough of it. I need to implement an unified system that deals with all the entries and the maps that you need to load. I didn't care how long it will take, I had to do it. And it definitely took quite a while, mainly because I had to deal with and rearrange my old crappy code. Probably it would have been much easier if I started thinking about this system and developing it from the very beginning. But hey, then my first videos would be extremely boring because I would be like writing a lot of code and there would be nothing to show off. For this system I created a location concept. Basically it's a room with up to four screens. These locations are connected using two data lists I created. 
The first one is all the entry points, basically the areas that trigger the map change when the player steps on them. The second list contains the data of the locations that those entry points leads to. So basically what items I need to load, how many NPCs are there and so on. So the map system is kind of working now, but it's still not ideal. There is still a separation between outdoor and indoor maps. Each has their own loading routines and the um, indoor maps have no scrolling and only limited to a single screen. I guess it's fine for now, but maybe I will improve that later. So I could finally add a new location with a villager's hut in it quite easily. If you enter that hut, you will find something that's supposed to be a hedgehog. But at that point, the hedgehog would ask for the same things the bear would. That's why I started implementing unique quests for each NPC. The hedgehog now will ask you for a knife and a spear. One of his rewards could be used for the bear's quest. After that, I decided to spend some time on the menu screen and rework it a bit because it looked quite ugly and depressing. I just had to get rid of that gray color. The current design is not final, of course. I would like to pull off something like in the Willow. This game has a pretty nice menu. Finally, I took the challenge to overcome the eight sprite per scanline limit. Probably you are already familiar with the flickering that usually happens in many Konami games when there are a lot of sprites on the screen. But did you know the flicker doesn't happen automatically? You actually need to code it because if you don't do anything, by default, all the extra sprites will simply disappear. So I had some vague ideas how to do it, but they were too complex and it was impossible to pull them off on a sluggish 2 MHz NES CPU. Little did I know there was a very simple way to display more sprites. Let's say I have a list of items that lay around in the map. So instead of drawing them usually like for instance from first item to the last, I should alternate the sprite updates like this. In one frame I should update items from the first to the last and in the next frame I should update items from the last to the first and I should repeat that process. Simple as that and you already can see more than 8 sprites in a line. Of course the sprites are blinking but it's still better than them being completely invisible. But the work for me didn't end there, because the problem was that my sprite update routine was constantly interrupted by the NMI. During the NMI, the sprite data is transferred from the OM to the PPU. My sprite drawing order alternations caused some unwanted blinking and some random sprites appearing where they shouldn't be. I figured maybe I could enable the data transfer to the PPU only if all the sprites were updated. Well, this fixed random blinking and unwanted sprites, but the sprite movement became very choppy. So I thought maybe I should optimize the sprite update routine so it would be much quicker. But that wasn't a very bright idea. After a few experiments, I found the solution and it was pretty simple. During the NMI call, I had to save a state in the RAM that the NMI was executed. And in the main loop, I needed to call the sprite update routine only then if this, this state was not zero. So basically, if the NMI was executed, then I need to update the sprites. And what do you know? It worked nicely. The sprites blink when they need to. Basically, the movement is smooth enough, so everything's alright. So yeah, that's about all the changes I had. If you want to check them for yourself, you can download the games ROM from my GitHub repository. Also, you can find the source code there. Feel free to subscribe the channel if you're interested in coming updates. I'll try to make videos more often. I guess that's it.
Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.